Scream happened at the worst imaginable time, and it's a miracle anyone saw it. But let's back up a bit. In 1764, the castle of Otranto was... This is probably too far back. Uh... Actually, I know where to begin because I can talk about my other, other boo, Georges Méliès. Watch the Hugo episode if you haven't seen it. It's lonely. In 1896, Méliès filmed The Haunted Castle, the scariest film ever made, and also the first scary film ever made. I think from there you can put the origins of horror on anything, like film studios filming circus performers, Godzilla War of the World, Psycho, Friggin' the Blob, or Village of the Damned. Horror definitely existed before 1968, but to do the genre the correct amount of service, nothing means nothing until 1968 when George Romero unleashed Night of the Living Dead onto the world. It changed cinema. People were like, holy shit, you can do that? And according to the MPAA, uh, yeah, c- kinda, you can, you can do that, I guess. And then the world got weird. The Beatles broke up, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and Otis Redding all passed on. By 1970, things were scary. The 70s are wild times, my lovelies. The Exorcist, Rosemary's Baby, Suspiria, The Omen. Horror was an art form that could be used to comment on society and our shared reality as metaphor. Then Poltergeist brought us into the 80s, itself a commentary on commercialization and suburban development, especially at that very, very specific moment in time. You know, building a subdivision on a graveyard and only moving the headstones because you, the developer, didn't give a shit in the first place. Right, coach? From there, the 80s were when horror went wild. Focusing only on three American franchises for one important purpose, Halloween, A Nightmare on Elm Street, and Friday the 13th. The moment horror basically turned into a 1980s never-ending cocaine waterfall. Make as much money as possible, as fast as possible. The Disney way. By the 90s in America, the cash flying from a never-ending money tornado was drying up. There were still horror films making money, but it was more cerebral affairs, Silence of the Lambs, Seven. Nobody in Hollywood wanted a slasher horror movie in the mid-90s. Enter Kevin Williamson, a writer who used his clout from the movie Scream to make... Uh, Dawson's Creek? But I get ahead of myself. Before that, Williamson was having trouble making ends meet. One of his screenplays, what would eventually become Teaching Mrs. Tingle, was floating around. He was watching true crime documentaries on TV when it gave him an idea. And that idea was a script called scary movie. Hollywood went nuts for the script, so they started calling all the horror icons they could think of, including Wes Craven, who said no, because they all said no multiple times. Then Drew Barrymore accepts the lead, Sidney Prescott, in the movie, which made Wes say yes. Then Drew says, What if instead of the lead, I played the character that died in the first reel? Yeah, that was Drew Barrymore's idea, pulling a psycho on the audience. Enter Nev Campbell and a host of up-and-comers. Scream was a wild success, eventually. And we'll get to that. But does it hold up? Well... Making a successful movie is like throwing a dart from space and hitting a bullseye. Everything has to go right. Scream was a 14 to 16 million dollar movie depending on your source. It opened in fourth place behind the fourth week of 101 Dalmatians live action remake, the second week of Jerry Maguire, and the opening weekend of Beavis and Butthead Do America. 
Cool. In cinematic terms, Scream was what you'd call an earner. It made more money in its second week of release than it did in its first one. It had a single week, its third week in release, where it managed to top 10 million at the box office domestically. Barely. Scream had a 23 week run, scraping and fighting and relying on word of mouth to get to its just barely more than $100 million haul in the United States. Word of mouth made Scream happen. Scream is a 1996 film directed by Wes Craven and written by Kevin Williamson, but you already knew that. I like underdog movies, especially movies that came out during the Tickle Me Elmo craze, because, yeah. Times are tough right now, so you gotta do what you can to survive. Oh, here's a funny one. But did you know? Scream is a Christmas movie. It was released on December 20th. The logic behind that is that teenagers and horror fans wouldn't have anything to watch during the Christmas break. The Christmas break where Beavis and Butthead do America came out. Because nothing explains Hollywood like convincing a horror icon to direct your film despite saying no repeatedly and then releasing that horror movie on Christmas. Because your name is Bob Weinstein. Throwing a dart from space. The most iconic stuff from this movie is seemingly a mistake as well, like just listen to Matthew Lillard talk about his performance in the movie after the fact. You know, this kind of crazy youth and this energy and was fearless and I just kind of was bouncing off the wall. <laughs> I look back at that performance, I'm like, what was he letting me do? It was ridiculous. I first saw Scream on VHS at my friend's house. It rocked my world. It somehow spoofed and made me think about horror movies while being the scariest thing I'd ever seen. If you've seen how Scream ends, you know how wild this gets. It was so dismissive of horror tropes while actively taking part in them. And it not only points them out, it disrupts them. There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. You can never have sex. <laughs> okay, number two, you can never drink or do drugs. Number three, never, ever, ever under any circumstances say, I'll be right back. It's a scream, baby. Hold on a sec. I'll be right back. Sydney Prescott, rule breaker. Careful. This is the moment when the supposedly dead killer comes back to life. Not in my movie. Nothing says throwing a dart from space quite like when you see what was going on with the design of the mask in this film. I know that uh, they had a lot of people drawing pictures, scary things, you know, witches, goblins, monsters, and they would send them to Wes. Either Wes liked them or didn't like them. Just none of them to me looked like the right mask. Not until a little painting in 1893 by Edward Monk did they have their answer and their title. You see, while scouting their locations for this movie, it was just on a bedpost in the house. Wow, it looks just like Edward Monk's 1893 painting The Scream, they said. Anyway, let's get back to making our movie called Scary Movie. What an unlikely and on-the-nose source of inspiration to just come along. What? Aren't all of your favorite horror films inspired by Norwegian Expressionist paintings as well? What's funny is that Scream's contribution to cinema is really interesting. What if you made a movie where the characters had all actually seen other movies? I'm gonna swing by the video store. I was thinking Tom Cruise and all the right moves. You know, if you pause it just right, you can see his penis. A movie born out of the disaffected 90s. This movie had every reason to just die on the vine, and yet a number of unplanned and in some cases entirely accidental factors led to it being a success. I don't say this enough, especially in an age where people routinely believe that a single person makes every decision on a movie, which is 1000% not how movies are made. Here's a funny way to look at it and how I think about movies all the time. Movies are a miracle. Getting to release a film is about the hardest thing you can do, and by the time you get there, you will have made 1,001 compromises with everyone from the actors to the costume department to the notes a studio gives you on a daily basis that might be as simple as, Hello, no one is available to take your call. Please leave a message after the tone.
Yeah, hey Greg, it's your boy The Dementia. There's not enough people eating sandwiches in this movie. Our data shows movies with sandwiches in them track well in the 14 to 19 demo, but like mayonnaise actually tracks really bad with kids under 15, so we're thinking like ham and cheese might be the simplest option here. Let me know what you're gonna do. Movies are a miracle. They're like throwing a dart from space. The biggest movies of 1996 in America were Independence Day and Twister. Scream, in a year where R-rated movies did quite well, arrived in a fitting 13th place for the year. Eraser was 14, a movie where Arnold Schwarzenegger shoots a crocodile in the face before uttering... <laughs> Your luggage. 1996 was weird, y'all. Yes, obviously the question in the thumbnail is rhetorical to get people to click the video and hopefully the audience is met with a bunch of stuff about a film that maybe they didn't know in the first place. Scream is a movie that very much shouldn't have happened. 23 weeks at the box office is almost six months. But did you know? This one's pretty cool, so I'm gonna go ahead and play it twice. But did you know? Scream came out on December 20th. It showed you can release a solid movie in that window and basically eat up the box office through the beginning of the year all the way up to the summer because people don't have anything else to watch. And guess who was paying attention to that experiment? Titanic wasn't done for its original summer release, so it was delayed, but it was released on December 19. Titanic is often lauded for its clever release schedule, but I see you, James. I see you. But does it hold up? Yes. Scream in 2019 is almost too relevant. A pair of cis boys blame powerful women for all of their problems. Women wreck their shit anyway. In your dreams. <laughs> You got killed with the TV! The tone of this movie is unapologetically 1996. Name a single goal or wish any character has. I'll wait. And I'll give you this one for free, I guess. Like, Sydney wants to be an actor for at least part of Scream 2, but can you name any goals? Randy, Tatum, Stu, Billy, what? Principal Fonzie. I guess in Scream 1, we know Sydney very much doesn't want to be Gail Weathers, but by movie 4, has completed her transformation into becoming Gail Weathers. I told you Scream has an arc! And I guess slasher films are good at that. You never get too attached, but that really isn't true either. If your series is about deconstructing horror films while inside of them, maybe don't kill the character that literally serves that purpose in only the second movie. And Halloween, I think, is really the movie that Scream goes after the hardest. It's pretty hard to watch the first Halloween with the rules in mind. Maybe Wes Craven was just airing his goofy grievances against John Carpenter. Who knows? But if you like slasher movies, especially ones that are too smart for their own good, you probably like Scream. I think it represents a moment in time we probably won't ever return to. I mean, the movie really only works because it treats having a cell phone like the crime that it is. You burnt cell phones. Scream is the last breath of the disaffected 1990s. Generation X. The generation before me. I was 14 when this film came out. Basically, that meant I went to school, played a lot of Worms 2, and wondered if Jordan Catalano liked me back. In the previous section, I told a few stories about how much of a nightmare, pun intended, out of respect, this movie was to make and bring to market. It makes Craven's involvement more meaningful to me. Especially when you look at what emotions Scream actually came from. I think the reason that I passed on it was my usual stupidity. Just, I, I have this long, long, career-long ambivalence towards doing genre films, but there is an element to the genre that is, uh, can be said to be misogynistic, for instance, and always carving up girls. And there's a part of me that feels like, how much longer do you want to do this? Nailed it. Another breezy and light movies with Mikey ending. I think about this moment a lot. That moment where he's like, 
Oh shit, it was me. Like, you can't point out one of the lingering shortcomings of your entire genre and not recognize your own part in it. I practically made this entire episode about that moment, that lightning bolt of introspection. Making this episode was a little scary because it crosses over a lot of avenues I don't generally enjoy exploring. Wes is no longer with us and people age. That's hard as an entertainer and that's hard on an entertainer. But let's go back to the beginning for a second. The first film Wes directed was The Last House on the Left. One of the origins of a lot of exceptionally troublesome tropes that would linger in the horror genre for decades. And Gene Siskel got it right when this was released, saying, My objection to The Last House on the Left is not an objection of the graphic representation of violence per se, but to the fact that the movie celebrates violent acts, particularly adult males abusing young women. I felt a professional obligation to stick around to see if there was any socially redeeming value in the remainder of the movie, and found none. That is a nuanced take on exploitation filmmaking from 1972, and one I agree with. And again, I'm back in this moment. So, Scream happens, they make Scream 2 immediately, like shockingly immediately. It was written, shot, and released less than a year later, and a week before Titanic, Small World, Scream 2 only spent seven weeks at the box office. Are you sitting? West directed Music of the Heart next, a touch sappy biopic about the very real and worthy of a movie, Roberta Gosperi. Streep was nominated for an Oscar and a Golden Globe because she's fantastic and so, 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 so very watchable in it. It also stars Angela Bassett and Gloria Estefan. It is a perfectly fine Sunday couch and cocoa movie that West shot the shit out of. Next up is Scream 3, and this entire scene with Carrie Fisher makes me ignore every issue I had with this movie. Did you work for the president? The president of the studio. $50? Who are you a reporter for Woodsboro High? And then came Cursed in 2005, a delayed release reteaming with Kevin Williamson that would do for werewolves what Scream did for those masks in Spirit of Halloween that did not go as uh, planned. Wes was vocally not happy with the end result and all of the studio meddling. But Red Eye also came out in 2005, a film I absolutely love that totally goes sunshine in the third act. But this is a masterclass in thriller filmmaking for the entire segment there on the plane. You should definitely watch this movie. My Soul to Take in 2010 was a rough one for Wes. It came from the right place, his wife produced it with him for the first time. It was also the first time Wes wrote, produced, and directed a film since Wes Craven's new nightmare. You know, lovable, chance-taking, weird Wes. And it didn't work this time. So in 2011, we take one last fun spin around the Scream block with Scream 4. He was 72 when this came out. It was the last film he'd make. The whole movie is worth existing just for the Hayden Panettiere phone gag that is one million percent Scream. Name the remake of the groundbreaking horror movie in which the villain... Uh, Halloween, uh, Texas Chainsaw, Dawn of the Dead, The Hills Have Eyes, Amityville Horror, uh, Last House on the Left, Friday the 13th, A Nightmare on Elm Street, My Bloody Valentine, When A Stranger Calls a Pop Night, Black Christmas, House of Wax, The Fog... Uh... I just think it's really funny that Scream said goodbye like that. And then four years later... He was gone. In my head, there aren't a lot of directors who just embraced the chaos of the universe quite like Wes Craven. Well, maybe Terry Gilliam. So much of their careers operated in Murphy's Law. Whatever can happen, will happen. Scream carries a lot of weight with me, and I think it's a hell of a fun horror movie if you're into that whole brevity thing. I totally understand if that's not your bag. 
to me, it has genuinely likable characters, and each film presents a compelling mystery along with its scares. And I miss him. I miss what he did for Hollywood, and I don't think there is a person living or dead who has ever thrown darts from space quite like Wes Craven did. And I just wanted to tell you a story about why I think that. There goes the list. Dave McIntyre, Woodland, Matt Hasinger, Ken Burns, John, Brett Busy, Che Burchard, Sam Bacon, Brosophie. If we try hard enough, someday I will get through the Black Tooth Bomb. Rob Golding, I am Clockwork. Hey, follow me on Twitter. Go get it on our Patreon and, and maybe consider joining because you can do stuff like editing streams and hang out in Discord with us and put your name on this list if you're in the pretzel tier along with Cinnamuins and Paul Moreau and Julian Rodriguez. I, there's no way to read it this fast. Which is kind of the fun challenge. How's everybody doing? Thanks for reaching the end of this video. I don't know why you're still listening to me. Mike Laidlaw, Amy Berg, Matt Charles, Brady, all top Gersh, men, and something about Lord Zorg. I don't even... I don't even know. Goodbye! <laughs>